I am delighted to introduce the speaker of this webinar, Dr. Hannah O'Rourke, who was the recipient of the CAG New Investigator Award in 2019. And just to note that that was the first time CAG um, awarded a New Investigator Award. Uh, Dr. O'Rourke is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Alberta, where she leads the Dementia Care Interventions Research Program. And with that, I will turn the microphone over to Hannah. And uh, please go ahead, Hannah. Uh, thank you so much for that, Verena. Thank you um, first to Verena and Anthony for organizing this CAKE webinar series and for inviting me to speak today. I'm excited to speak with you all today, not only because I've been um, working in a very quiet room all by myself for the last couple of weeks, um, but also because it's giving me the opportunity to reflect on some of the work that I've been doing um, over the past few years. And I'm just delighted to have that opportunity to share some of it with you today. Okay, I'm just figuring out how to move my slides. There we go. So I want to acknowledge first, um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking today about a number of different studies. And so I'm acknowledging a number of different um, sources of funding. And of course, the Canadian Association of Gerontology New Investigator Award um, is really important to acknowledge in particular today. Today, I want to talk about how we might be able to move from contact to meaningful feelings of meaningful connection for people with dementia um, and some of the challenges and strategies that we face in a research agenda toward this aim. So I'm going to start the presentation today talking about the stakes and trying to make the argument that the stakes are high, that if we want to care about quality of life, that we need to care about loneliness and that we need to do some work to develop some interventions to address loneliness. I'm then going to talk about challenges and strategies to address these challenges um, related to definitions, building intervention theory, um, how we might address stakeholder concerns, measure outcomes like loneliness, and then really importantly feasibility and what it's like to actually work um, in the real world and some of the challenges that that raises. My research aims to find ways or interventions, if you will, to support people with dementia to achieve quality of life despite their cognitive deterioration. The population of people with dementia is large and growing. In 2012, there were 819 million of people, million people over, oops, sorry, there must be um, a timing thing on there. I'm just gonna move back to this slide. In 2012, there were 819 million people over 60, and by 2050, there will be 2 billion older adults, including about 402 million people over 80. There was a study in 2013 that estimated the international prevalence rates of dementia, which rose to more than 10% for people aged 80 to 84. Numbers like this are frequently cited to alarm the listener to take the problem of dementia seriously. This is a powerful and pervasive narrative. Yet personal and professional experience and writers like Tom Kitwood, who many of us know as the father of person-centered care, the person-centered care movement, inspire and challenge many of us to think differently about the dementia problem. The first step for me was to shift focus from the person with dementia as problematic, to think instead about our societal and personal responses to people with cognitive impairment. Sometimes seeing things differently requires changing angles to find the right light. Those with advanced dementia remember a few past events, struggle to communicate verbally, and need extensive assistance with activities of daily living. Despite this profound impairment, people with dementia have described that not all is bleak and that there are opportunities for quality of life if we listen and respond to their concerns. How can we provide the best response the best support to improve quality of life. What do people with dementia ask of us when we take the time to listen? This diagram shows factors that affect quality of life from the perspectives of people with dementia. Um, this was a meta-synthesis that I conducted looking at all of the uh, qualitative literature that's asked people with dementia about their quality of life and what might be important to enhancing it. 
And there was four key areas that came out as really important to influencing quality of life for people with dementia. Today, I'm gonna to be primarily focusing on one of those areas. Connectedness was a, a concept that was important to each of those, but today I really wanna talk about feelings of connection in relationships with others. Fundamentally, the, the high priority that people with dementia place on relationships and a feeling of social connectedness shows that this is a high stakes issue from the perspectives of people living with dementia. People with living with dementia want to feel connected to others. Other research has also identified that social connectedness is a human need, a basic human need, a priority for quality of life, and it's associated with other key outcomes. So one of those key outcomes, and this is a systematic review that's been quite highly cited in this area, is looking at the influence of loneliness and social isolation on mortality risk. This um, this uh, systematic review included over 70 studies that looked forward in time, so they were all prospective studies, and they looked first for people who were either lonely or socially isolated, and then looked forward in time to see how their mortality risk changed. People were followed on average for about seven years in this study. So I just want to take a moment to look at some of their, some of their data. So they divided out um, the findings, looking separately at social isolation, living alone, and loneliness. And they found that regardless of which of those measures you looked at, the odds of mortality or of death at follow-up were increased significantly um, for people who had started out being socially isolated, living alone, or who were lonely. <laughs> Their findings are really interesting, and, and if you don't have a sense of you know, how much is an increase in the odds of, of, of death, if we look at um, people who are lonely had a 1.26 increase in the odds of death as complete, compared to those who weren't, the authors do a great job of putting this into context or perspective for us. So they report that this mortality risk is similar to what has been reported to, and I'll just read from their list, substance abuse, obesity, physical activity, responsible sexual behavior, mental health, injury and violence, environmental quality, access to health care and immunization. So given that, given their findings, they suggest that there's strong evidence that both um, there's strong evidence to consider social isolation and loneliness um, as key public health concerns. This is my Oma. She was an incredibly hard worker and a loving wife and mother to four boys. She was a strong woman who was widowed in her 50s and lost a son in a car accident when he was 18. Despite challenges in her life, she was an optimist. As my Oma, she made me doll clothes when I was a girl, was there for every celebration, gave foot, rub, foot rubs, and was an integral part of our daily lives. She also lived as a person with dementia for her last few years of life. She struggled at this time, and these photographs are taken at that time. Despite daily visits from my parents, she could easily become anxious and lonely. She liked many staff that helped her, but also resented that she could not work and contribute in the ways that she was used to. Half a million Canadians have dementia and issues they experience can perpetuate loneliness. Their communication tends to be impaired. They forget recent interactions with significant others, may lack a confidant, can struggle with relocation to congregate living like a long-term care or supportive living community and spend too much time idle or alone the literature supports that each of these things can lead to loneliness. The opposite of loneliness is social connectedness. I believe that we must address loneliness because when we do, we are addressing suffering. My program of research focuses on interventions to promote social connectedness and quality of life for older adults with dementia and their family caregivers. Today, I'm going to be focusing on the challenges and strategies with 
um, developing these sorts of interventions that are targeting in particular people with dementia. Um, I co-lead another study with Dr. Wendy Duggleby looking at uh, the influence of a uh, support tool on an online tool on the outcomes for family caregivers, but it's a different population and, and some of the, the challenges and strategies are different. So I'm going to really focus today on um, people with dementia. So in an effort to prevent the negative consequences of loneliness, I believe we need interventions to improve social connectedness. And the interventions need to be feasible for implementation in daily practice, as well as acceptable to key stakeholders. There's challenges in addressing this. I'm going to start with those now. The first challenge I want to talk about is one of conceptual clarity. So when we say social connectedness, what are we talking about, really? People use the term in a lot of different ways. So I want to take some time to talk with you today about what I mean by the term social connectedness. Here's a nice table. Um, this is also from that meta-analysis that I was speaking about earlier, um, where they differentiate between some key outcomes, identifying how they're defined and how they might be measured. So social isolation, I'm going to focus on a lot of people confuse the term social isolation and loneliness but they are actually different concepts social isolation refers to a lack of social contact so it's an objective it's a more objective measure um, whether somebody actually has contact with others or has friends within their network or has um, family that are living close by or has the ability to um, uh, participate in different kinds of social activities. Those are objective measures about someone's contact with others. In contrast, loneliness is subjective. It reflects feelings of isolation, disconnection, and not belonging. But it's really important to highlight that the key about loneliness is, so, is how a person feels. So this brings me back to my title slide where I say from contact to feelings of connection. So while many interventions um, aim to increase the amount of contact someone has, and that can be a very valid way to try to promote feelings of connection, we can't assume that because we've increased contact that now we've actually addressed loneliness because someone can have a lot of contact with others and feel utterly alone. We need to be looking at both of these concepts and measuring them um, in distinct ways. Um, this was a definition of social connectedness that um, myself and Dr. Sidani had developed in a literature review that we completed to try to understand what social connectedness might mean for older adults and what might be some of the influencing factors and outcomes of it. And this was a definition that we derived from the literature on this topic. In this review, we identified that social connectedness is the opposite of loneliness. And so given that, social connectedness is also a feeling. It's a subjective evaluation of the extent to which one has meaningful, close and constructive relationships with others. And it can be operationalized or in other ways, in, in, in other words, measured as caring about others and feeling caring about others and that feeling cared about by others and that refers to um, sort of feelings of more intimate relationships the ability to have intimate relationships more like a one-on-one -on -one or smaller groups um, and it's also another component of it though is that it's about feelings of belonging to a group or community so there's two aspects to feelings of social connectedness The review um, also identified some influencing factors. This is not all of them, but this is just um, some of the top potential influencing factors that other research has looked at to try to um, to try to attest the association with with loneliness. So, and I just have highlighted a couple that are social in nature to again highlight that while these things are related they are not the same thing as loneliness or social connectedness so one social network 
refers to those structural characteristics of one's social ties, and that's where we would put social isolation or social contact. That's a feature of a person's objective structural network. Social support is another concept as well, and it's about whether or not people receive different kinds of support from the people in their network. Um, and it's, again, potentially influences loneliness or feelings of social connection, but is not the same as that. You could have a, a network which includes people who give you a lot of, for example, appraisal support, and potentially you may not appreciate all of that appraisal support. Appraisal support is when people are giving you kinds of information or trying to, or even, um, or more like advice. And so you may not always appreciate those kinds of support and might actually lead you to feeling more disconnected. That's a possibility. So an important potential influencing factor, but not the same thing as social connectedness. There was an interesting study done by uh, Shida and Hini, which is cited in this table, and they found that feeling connected may actually influence older adults' well-being more than either one's social network or social support. So it just goes to highlight again that um, really important for us to look at social connectedness and how people actually feel when we want to think about improving things like well-being or quality of life. Challenge two. Um, in this area is around intervention design and adaptation. So while we have a body of literature which has looked at um, addressing social connectedness and loneliness for older adults, has designed interventions in that area, and I just put an example of a review um, that I had led which where we looked at all of these interventions and classified them according to their active ingredients, or in other words, like how is it that we think they work? What is it about these interventions that we think they work? So we, it's a descriptive piece looking at those interventions. Um, and it's just one review of actually quite a number of reviews that have been done looking at um, interventions to address loneliness among older adults. Um, so we have interventions related to older adults that we can draw on. But people with dementia have not been the focus of these interventions. They've been actually excluded from, uh, from many interventions, even those that have been conducted in long-term care environments where we know the majority of people actually have dementia. So we have a bit of a limitation in terms of intervention theory. When I say intervention theory, this refers to a description of the way in which an intervention is hypothesized to affect outcomes and in the context in which it might do that. So we can develop intervention theory from, from what's been done with older adults. We can look at what's, how are the, have these been hypothesized to work and what are their key features. But then we need to really carefully consider that if we're trying to use these with cognitively um, impaired older adults, that that is now a, a quite a different context and we probably need to adapt um, some of these interventions to use uh, in those environments. So I'm going to talk now about a, a couple of promising interventions. Um, these personal contact and group activity interventions have been used, these are the most often used interventions that have been used with older adults, and both have shown um, that they have show promise uh, to have positive, a positive impact on loneliness and social connectedness for older adults. So I'm just going to describe what they are first. Uh, personal contact is essentially scheduled but unscripted one-to-one -one contact with either a human or an animal. Um, some people would call a human intervention like this as a, they would call it a visiting program. You may see that terminology. Some people would call a personal contact intervention that's using an animal as animal therapy. You see that terminology a lot as well. But based on its active ingredients, which is really just increasing the amount of contact with a human or animal, these personal contact interventions can be lumped together in that way. They tend to occur face-to-face, -face, 
and previous uh, literature with older adults has the time span is typically 30 to 60 minutes once per week for somewhere between 6 and 12 weeks. Group activity. Um, we see a lot, any of us who are familiar with long-term care home environments, see a lot of group activity type interventions happening. However, we haven't seen research that's actually targeting people with dementia to see how these um, work to influence loneliness or social connectedness. Group activity looks like joining a new group of people, usually five to nine, and engaging in an activity with interest and with each other. So it's got two components that are thought to influence loneliness, this engagement with the activity and with each other. Um, it's intended to occur face to face and for about an hour and a half once per week for six weeks. So, so these are the descriptions of promising interventions from what's been done with older adults um, and could potentially be taken forward and adapted for use with people with dementia. As part of that adaptation, I'm going to bring us then to challenge number three. A big part of adapting to the needs of people with dementia is addressing this, the concerns of key stakeholders. In this, um, I, I would suggest that some of the key stakeholders in this situation are people with dementia, their family and friends, and healthcare providers. And their family and friends and healthcare providers are really important to talk to because they have different kinds of influences on um, ensuring whether people with dementia will be allowed to participate in these interventions. For example, during a consent process where we may have to ask family or friend to provide consent on behalf of the person with dementia. Um, and they also may be involved in the interventions in some way. For example, they may be asked to participate in the intervention if we are inviting a family or friend to participate as a visitor. Or they may be asked to help with some sort of setup. For example, as a healthcare provider, they may have to set up some sort of equipment or help with scheduling. So it's really important to understand these perspectives. And we refer to this as acceptability. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about acceptability as a concept before I move, move on here. Why does acceptability matter? Think about the last time that a medical professional asked you to do something. Perhaps it was a physio exercise or taking a drug prescription. How did your perceptions of this intervention influence your use of it in your daily life? As you were thinking about this, you may be reflecting upon whether you thought the intervention would work, whether it made sense to you and fit your life and needs and how difficult it was to enact. Each of these features are features of acceptability, and these greatly influence whether or not a person will actually do the thing they have been asked or even told to do. Fundamentally, if they don't do it, it cannot have a positive effect. So if we want to develop interventions that have the potential to have a positive impact, we really need to pay attention to acceptability. I'm going to give an example now of a study that I did to look at acceptability of personal contact and group activity interventions. This was a um, mixed methods study, just meaning that we included both quantitative and qualitative um, modes of data collection and both considered both of those during the analysis phase in order to reach our conclusions. Um, we included a convenient sample of family and friends and healthcare providers of people with dementia. Um, for each of the interventions, the participants got a description provided in quite simple terms to clarify the goals, activities, benefits, and risks of the intervention, and, and those were from the empirical literature. The description was then followed by six items to rate the intervention in terms of its relative appropriateness, so whether it was perceived to be logical, suitable, and effective in ameliorating loneliness, as well as the risks and conveniences of implementing it. We uh, adapted this, um, this measure from the treatment acceptability and preference measure. And then we followed that measure with semi-structured interviews to explore people's per perspectives in more depth, to really get a sense of what it was that people were seeing as promising, but also as problematic about these interventions. A 
our sample in, was primarily women, uh, was a majority of women, and we had a quite a large um, age range. We had healthcare providers and family and friends represented, and for the healthcare providers, um, they came mostly from uh, long-term care long-term care environments, whereas family and friends um, were primarily uh, most familiar with people who were living with dementia in more community settings. So I just want to clarify a little bit about the acceptability measure before I move on so you'll understand the next slide. So the questions again were about the intervention was effective, logical, suitable, easy, and whether they're willing to participate. And it was a five point scale for each question. And I'm just highlighting in red the piece around um, what a number two means. It means that they had rated the, as for example, effective or you could say logical, suitable. So that is that kind of, I, I've used that in a cut point uh, um, in interpreting some of our findings because I, uh, I think that it's a, a useful spot to say, well, at least they're saying effective, very effective or very much effective. There's an additional question that asks about risk and that's from zero not bad at all to four um, very bad. And I'll report that a little bit. Uh, I'll report that separately because the scale is a little bit different. So I just want to show some of the um, findings here. So highlighted in red are um, everyone who, the proportion of people that rated as a two or greater um, for each of the different elements. So some differences can be observed between the different interventions. When If we look at the item frequencies, when we look at how participants were rating each element um, as a two or greater. I'm going to talk first about the first three rows, so in terms of effectiveness, logic, and suitability. Human contact was rated by nearly all participants as effective, logical, and suitable. High proportions of participants also rated group activity interventions as effective, logical, and suitable. Animal contact was rated highly in each of these areas, but the proportions were somewhat lower in terms of its effects, logic, and suitability, more in the 80s instead of the 90s and 100. But across the board, the three interventions did quite well in this particular area. I think when we start to get into more trouble with the interventions is around ease of delivery and willingness to participate. In terms of ease of del delivery, animal contact was considered by participants as being about as easy to deliver as human contact, but still not really easy. They, around 68% and 72% are saying that this is easy to deliver. Um, when we get to group activity interventions, though, it, the number gets quite low. Just 36% of people are seeing group activity interventions as being easy to deliver in the way that's de described. Um, as being engaging in activity and with others. In terms of willingness to participate, we see that participants were equally willing to participate in either human contact or animal contact interventions at about 72%, but just 44% of people are willing to participate in group activity interventions. So again, a little bit lower willingness to participate there for group activity. But across the board, we see um, that one of the biggest areas is potentially ease of delivery with willingness to participate being another potential area of concern with these interventions. Risk severity wasn't seen as being very high for any of them. So these are just the results for each. Um, of the interventions. Animal contact was rated the riskiest, but 56% still say to the risks were not bad at all. Um, group activity was pretty low risk, 30, 64% saying they were not, not bad at all. Um, and human contact was seen as the least risky with just 72%, with just 24% saying that they could see maybe somewhat bad risks from that. So, um, the interventions aren't looking that risky and the qualitative findings actually give some good insight into how they can any perceived risks could be could be addressed um so we have really rich qualitative data from this study but for the purpose of this presentation i'm just going to present some highlights 
from the qualitative data that support some of the key um, questions that were raised from the quantitative phase. Um, but if you do have other questions from that, from the quantitative stuff that I've just presented, please ask them because there are quite a number of insights that have come from the qualitative data and I can speak to those during the question period. Um, so just a couple of notes from the qualitative findings then. Group activity interventions, why might they have been rated less easy to deliver and why a lower willingness to participate as compared to the other interventions? Results from the followed-up structured interviews showed that it is essential to attend to the specific needs of people with moderate and severe dementia, deliver the activities in an individualized way, support communication abilities, and address stigmas related to dementia. And each of these areas has some effect on the potential ratings for group activity interventions. So, for example, in terms of focus and attention, uh, people were concerned that people, that participants were concerned that people with dementia may not have the ability to focus and attend for a full hour during um, during a group activity session. Um, so this could be fairly easily addressed by having uh, shorter sessions, but there was a range. People, there were some people that thought this was the right amount of time, some people that thought it wasn't quite enough, but in general, the idea of focus and attention um, came up um, time and again, and not only related to the amount of time that the intervention was to go for, but just the abilities of people with dementia to focus in general came up as a concern for this intervention. Um, because it's a group environment and maybe more distracting. Assumptions and stigma tended to come up as well. So, for example, um, the idea that there may not be value to an intervention because the person can't remember that it happened is something that came up uh, quite a number of times. The other issue that came up was around um, the importance of, in a group activity intervention, interaction through verbal communication and how that might be important or not. So most people thought that was really important, that you need to be able to verbally communicate, but had a hard time identifying other potential ways of connecting with one another once verbal communication becomes, um, becomes more uh, impaired. Um, so there was some stigma around that, around the abilities of people to engage uh, given, their, given their cognitive or communicative impairments. In terms of personal contact interventions, why, here's a question from the findings of why animal contact may have been somewhat lower in the perceptions of effective, logical, or suitable. And I think it came down to um, that human contact was really seen as essential by the participants. This was essential to feel loved, to feel valued. And it was seen as being very reasonable to think that we need to have people with dementia having uh, human cute contact. Whereas with animal contact, it was seen as being um, a, a promising approach, but maybe not for everyone depending on their preferences and their history um, with, with animals and, and pets. So to sum up from that particular study, all three of the interventions do appear promising and low risk. Individualizing the interventions would be important and phase two trials, or another word for that would be pilot studies, need to focus on assessing feasibility and acceptability of um, flexible, ver flexible versions of these interventions. Um, so that they are addressing uh, people with dementia who have different needs and at, and at different stages. And during those pilots, we need to really look at the experiences and perceptions of people with dementia that are receiving those interventions to understand how acceptable they are from the perspective of people with dementia. Challenge four, um, I'm gonna go through a bit more quickly. It's related to measuring outcomes. I think it's important to touch on because a lot of times when I talk about this work, people say, well, how can you measure loneliness or social connectedness? It's a feeling. It's supposed to be self-reported. And some people believe that we can't actually get self-report ratings um, from people with cognitive impairment. And this belief has led to the exclusion of a lot of uh, exclusion of people with dementia from most intervention studies. So this just shows a table which um, shows that um, for people with cognitive impairment, there's a very small proportion where the majority of the sample would 
uh, for a study targeting loneliness, where, where the majority of the sample, just 6.8 percent um, in the studies that we reviewed, would actually include a majority of people who are cognitively impaired. And even in that situation, the intervention wasn't focused on people who are cognitively impaired. So, um, and, and this challenge of measurement is one of the reasons. So I just wanted to propose some options. There have been measures used to assess loneliness um, among people living with dementia. So one item, one example is a three-item loneliness scale. So it's been used in large population-based studies, not so much in intervention research, but large population-based studies that do include people with cognitive impairment. Um, but there's been limited validation of that scale within um, groups with uh, groups with dementia. So it has limitations using that scale. What about using relevant quality of life subscales? Because we have quite a number of quality of life tools that have been developed for use with people with dementia, and many of them have subscales that are relevant that could be used in this situation. So here's just some examples um, of the DEMQUAL or the DQAL that measure social relationships and social belonging. They might not be perfect. They weren't measured specifically to measure loneliness or social connectedness, but if we review the items and look at the meaning of those subscales, we can see that they might be good enough. And in the one of my mentors uh, is always saying that we need to make sure that we don't allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And I think this may be one of those situations where we can move forward and address this issue by looking at some of these uh, quality of life scales. In severe dementia, it would also, in particular, it's also probably a good idea to look at other indicators that might be looked, linked with loneliness, like engagement, behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. Um, but we need to do that alongside the measurement of social, the actual measurement of social connectedness and loneliness so that we can continue to develop and test those theories of those links. The last um, challenge that I'll talk about just for the last few minutes here before moving to questions and discussion is around intervention feasibility. And this is um, an area where I am spending a lot of my time right now. And it really asks the question is, in pilot studies, we're really asking what is possible during the research? And then at the back of our minds, or even at the front of our minds, should always be the question, what is gonna be possible after the research ends? Because it doesn't make sense to develop an intervention that could never be continued after we've been done studying it. That's not going to do much for helping to address this problem. So I'll give some examples. Um, one example that I have is called the Connecting Today pilot. This is a um, pilot study that I've uh, been working on to assess feasibility and acceptability of a personal contact intervention. The active ingredient for this intervention, as we've talked about before, is simply increasing the amount of time that a person with dementia spends with a visitor while residing in long-term care. In our version of the intervention, the person with dementia chooses a family member, relative, friend, or volunteer to spend time with or talk to, and they would interact with that same person for all sessions. The visits can occur face-to-face -face or over the phone and are scheduled for a minimum of 30 minutes once per week for six weeks. Um, as a big part of this pilot study, we are asking people with dementia that, and the family that choose to participate about their perceptions of the visits. This is just the base model of the intervention to get us um, trying to understand how this could work in these settings. And during the pilot, and participants were told they don't need to complete all the sessions or do them in exactly the way that we've talked about in order to be able to participate in the study. For example, some people might only participate over the phone. They might not be able to do any face-to-face -face sessions or some might not be able to commit to six sessions or to sessions that are 30 minutes in length. We've really told participants to do what they can and that a big part of what we're studying is what is actually possible for people with dementia in long-term care homes and their families. Okay, I, I'm not going to show, I, the analysis for this study is in progress, but I want to, in terms of feasibility, this is a really key, important issue that I want to talk about. Um, recruitment. 
this has been a huge issue in this study, and I've had this issue in a past pilot that I did of a group activity intervention as well. So I just want to talk through this diagram a little bit. We started out with a pool of 103 potentially eligible residents. Um, by the time, those were identified by the clinic staff, so by uh, care home staff. By the time the care home staff had approached the residents, or most of the time they were approaching powers of attorney, um, this reduced to 69. And we don't have the reasons, unfortunately, for why we had this big reduction at this point. But when we look at the next reduction from 69 participants to 15, who we were actually able to enroll in the study, we can get a bit of a sense of what might have been going on. So I want to focus um, just for the last minute or so here on that group of non-consenters, which is 35 participants. And what are their top reasons for not consenting to participate in the study? And remember, this is powers of attorney or primarily decision makers, not usually people with dementia that are saying uh, no to consenting to participate in the study. So the top reasons for non-consent um, of those 35, 16 of the people said that the reason they were not consenting was that it was not suitable for residents' condition or ability. Um, so these are just some examples. When asked about scheduling phone calls, the family member states the phone calls don't work as the resident has difficulty understanding what a phone is. Um, remember that this intervention involves a research assistant that will facilitate making the phone call. So the person doesn't really need to understand what a phone is at this point because it's facilitated. But it goes back to um, sort of those feelings around what people with dementia are capable of and what might benefit them that we may need to address. Um, or family members stating the resident cannot communicate verbally. So that idea again, that we need to be able to have verbal communication in order to have a visit. So um, these go to some of the people's perceptions around residents' conditions or abilities, and some of them um, might be valid. And in other situations, I think perhaps us as researchers can just do a lot better job at explaining um, to potential participants what the potential benefits are and how we're going to be mitigating challenges that they're raising. The next piece uh, concerns regarding questionnaires. So people th thought that um, a number of people said no to participation because it was just too many questions or um, that it might be too burdensome the actual study procedures. So that's an area where we can really do some work to streamline what do we absolutely need to ask in order to really get the data that we need to determine whether this intervention is going to be um, feasible or not. Um, so any time we can ask fewer questions, I think we need to do that while still maintaining the priority of trying to understand perspectives of the participants in, in assessing this intervention as feasible or acceptable. Um, the point around family members not giving proper answers to questions, again, that's that's potentially um, true. Perhaps they were too cognitively impaired to answer some of our um, questions. And so in that case, again, as researchers, we need to look to see how can we modify our procedures so that people aren't being excluded for their level of cognitive impairment. But it also sometimes goes to family members' perspectives that um, due to the cognitive impairment, the person's responses aren't valid and we need to do some work explaining to potential participants that um, people with dementia, even though they don't always sound as though they are accurate, the research has shown that people with dementia can talk about how they feel and give a valid discussion of how they feel in that moment. Um, the last example that I'll get very quickly is a study that we're developing a group um, activity, a, a group, a music-based group activity intervention. Um, and because I want to have time for discussion, I'm not going to talk too much about this right now, except to say that the challenge that we're encountering primarily with this one is around cost. So we want to facilitate, we want to deliver these really high quality interactive musical sessions with people with dementia, and we're paying the musicians to do that. And so um, we are, as a team, um, looking at ways that we can design this intervention in a way that's going to consider how we can have musicians that are still really high quality but aren't going to um, cost too much to be able to um, sustain once the research is over. 
So I want to thank you and open it up for questions. I've really, I've aimed to describe in this presentation the background of why we need to care about loneliness among people with dementia and have, have shared with you some thoughts um, to consider as we move this research agenda forward to address what I think is a really high stakes problem. And I would welcome any uh, questions or discussion now. Thanks so much, Hannah, for this uh, very interesting presentation, which also seems to be particularly timely at this time of, uh, of uh, COVID-19 and social distancing and, and you know, reduced visiting and so on. We have had a number of questions come in, so I'll take them uh, as they've come in. And the first question was, are there any intervention studies that place persons living with dementia at the center of the research? And probably there's two aspects, I'm gonna read into this question, that there's two pieces to this question. One has to do with what you alluded to in terms of how many studies have actually included persons living with dementia, but also the other piece to it, are there any is there research that has actually really in, in, engaged a person's living with dementia as, as co-creators of the research, as true participants in creating the research? Um, that's a great question. I think, okay, so I'll, I'll just say that my, um, when I'm reviewing the literature, I'm looking at interventions that are focusing on social connectedness and loneliness in particular. So I'll just say there's in, there is lots of inter, there are interventions out there where, which are focused on people with dementia, but maybe not focusing on loneliness, social connectedness in particular. I um, was I was recent I was just looking into the literature again to try to um, update because that review that I conducted was published in 2015. So I was just trying to update um, sort of my background on what kind of interventions we are seeing now. And I did find, I did find a couple of new um, studies that were really focused on people with dementia. They're really in early stages of development. So there was for, for example, for personal contact interventions, there was a study by Wendy Moyle um, in 2017 where she's looking at telepresence. Um, so sort of uh, the feasibility of whether we can use um, this particular telepresence approach to um, connecting people with dementia with their family and friends in, in long-term care settings. And um, so it was, a, it was a small study, feasibility, uh, sort of almost a pre-feasibility study. It wasn't quite at the level of a full feasibility study. Um, but um, I guess a question I would have from that, so they didn't have the data that I had shown around recruiting people to actually participate in these interventions. So I think there are some new studies, they're in early stages. Um, Sometimes th there's a number focusing, for example, on telepresence, and we also have a number of studies that are focusing on other kinds of technologies like um, uh, some of the robots that we've seen like Paro, robotic animals for increasing feelings of connection. So there's a number of these that are focused on people with dementia, um, really early stages, um, limited data even as to their feasibility. And I think it's good to look at the different, the different approaches um, and to new technologies. And I think those are interesting, but I think there's a bit of an elephant in the room when we're thinking of, if I think, if I look back to my experience of doing this with just the phone or just in-person visits or the phone and the challenges of recruiting people with dementia. So I'm not always sure that the problem is one of not having the right technology, but of some other things that are going on to try to figure out the best ways that we can connect people. Um, in terms of the more participatory stuff in this area, I haven't, come across of a, a, a participatory, more participatory approach to de co-design. I, I might have missed it, but I am not aware of it. All right, thanks very much for that. Um, and in the second question relates to technology. You've already talked about that, but let me, I guess, ask you the more specific question regarding that. And given the, the restrictions in visiting that we are under right now in terms of long-term care, 
what would you recommend? How do people stay in touch? Or is, is there a technological way to do that? Would that be useful? What's your advice? I think um, we need we need to find ways to continue to stay in touch. I mean, COVID is an exceptional situation, um, but it really highlights actually a very current reality, particularly in care homes for many older adults, which is that many older adults already are isolated and that they don't often have visits. And there's a lot of reasons um, that people aren't necessarily visiting due to other demands in their lives due to their potentially their relationship with that person so there's lots of reasons why people don't visit but one of those reasons is certainly accessibility and if we can use technological situations uh, solutions to increase um, that accessibility that's a great idea but I would say like let's look first to what are the easiest things that might be available that we could increase use of so the phone i think it's really we we've had the phone around for a while i think we should try to find ways there's a lot of residents that don't have phones in their rooms so we need to think first of what's the technological solution but then how does that need to be facilitated um so that people can actually access that technology so in our study we were having res research assistants making phone calls and also bringing in phones bringing in a cell phone to make that phone call um, because the resident couldn't necessarily do that for them for themselves so i don't think that it hurts ever to explore opportunities to connect virtually and a family member who is able to visit because right now we have people who can have for example um like one core family member visiting in care home, the care home, even though um, COVID is an issue, that person could be facilitating a phone call with other people. Um, staff in our acceptability study said that they would be very willing to facilitate these sorts of interactions, that they felt it was part of their job, that they felt committed to supporting people with dementia to have the best possible quality of life, for example, by helping with a phone call but that it needed to be part of their job description and that they needed to have the time to do it. So I guess at the organizational level, we need to think about how we're assigning tasks and what we're prioritizing when we do that. Does that answer that question? Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next question relates to the concerns that you have mentioned that people had. So does there need to be an information, do there need to be information sessions for family members to, uh, to negate some of these concerns? Yes, I think something like that. There needs to be information um, delivered. And I mean, we, we did deliver, I think there's a difference. We've been talking a lot in our team about the difference between information and marketing and what's the right balance here because I think people do need information about what is known in the in the research about the importance of social connection about the importance of that from the perspective of people with dementia that it remains important despite cognitive impairment but we need to think about carefully about how we package that information and market it to people to try to get at some of these um, some of these underlying concerns so we did try to do some of that um actually in our connecting today study we had our first round of recruitment we saw that we'd seen a lot of loss and we thought okay we need to look back to our materials that we're providing and we adjusted them in a number of ways but and i and it did seem to help unfortunately our first wave of recruitment was our biggest wave so we lost the most people at that stage so we're going to be bringing some of those strategies forward for example um, just highlighting the importance of, of loneliness or social connection. For example, uh, we're going to be bringing some of those strategies forward to our next pilot, and I'm hoping to see that that helps to improve some of our rates, our recruitment rates. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question relates to uh, the issue, the really, really important issues of hearing loss and vision loss and uh, dual sensory loss that a lot of people, uh, persons living with dementia uh, also have besides the dementia and how does that factor into interventions and how do we deal with those issues as they create communication barriers? Yes, yeah, so every intervention, that's a, that's a great question, um, every intervention needs to be thought of carefully in terms of who it might be appropriate for. So there ends up being inclusion-exclusion criteria for each type of intervention that we go forward with. 
um, in terms of the phone, for example, if you have too much hearing loss, that's not going to be something that's viable. Um, so I think we can't ever expect one intervention to address this problem. The problem is too big, I think, and multifaceted. I think what would be important is to aim for is the development of a suite of interventions that people could choose from that can be um, adapt. And each of those interventions in turn should also be adaptable so that we can adapt to people's different needs. So um, for someone with uh, profound hearing and vision loss, an animal contact intervention may be, may be really appropriate, an in-person animal contact intervention, because it doesn't rely on any kind of, you don't have to be able to communicate verbally. Also looking at ways that we can help um, family or friends or volunteers who are visiting to interact in nonverbal ways using touch, using, um, using uh, engagement within uh, a particular activity in that moment. So we need to do some more work, I think, around specifying what the parameters of the, how the intervention could be adapted to meet people's different, people's different needs. We didn't have a lot of people with um major hearing or vision impairment in our particular study but that could have been some of the people that we were losing because we weren't presenting to the potential participants the potential adaptations so it's a great question yeah thanks a lot um just because uh we're running out of time here if people want to just refer to the chat box there are a number of uh useful links that have been supplied to a uh, comment around Para, the, the SEAL robot, uh, various resources that are available. Uh, let me just ask one last question, a very specific one, about whether you have considered the Java music program for your intervention. Um, I had considered the Java music program. So, um, I, I need to just qualify that. So the two interventions that I'm moving forward with at this point are, are specific type. So personal contact is a specific type of intervention. It has particular features as well as a group activity has some particular features. And I believe I'd seen the Java music program, but it hadn't quite met those criteria for being that, that type of intervention to move forward with. So I was really trying to look to um, move forward some particular forms of intervention where we could, where, where we could um, build knowledge in those particular areas. So I had considered it, but it just hadn't been quite fitting with the personal contact or group activity that I'd chosen to proceed with. All right, thank you so very much.